welcome back for another Heresy Hump Day. It has been a while since my last one, and um, I will talk about that in a moment. But today's topics are the movie Hostiles um, by Scott Cooper, um, to flow right from that Western tabletop games. And then after that, I want to have a discussion on the golden age of tabletop gaming. And so, um, today my sponsor will be Heineken. So, nothing actually too extravagant. But, um, yeah, just a tried and true. For those of you that like this series, um, I'm not going to stop the series, but I have actually had a lull in the series. And, um, you know, I think what it mainly has been is that um, when I did this a long time ago as a Q&A, the material was somewhat thrown at me in the sense that I didn't have to spend a lot of creative energy preparing. Um, and what I found was is that I kind of preferred this kind of series where I spent some time thinking about topics that I was passionate about, um, and it really sort of got my creative juices flowing. And, you know, it mainly relates to the tabletop gaming hobby, but um, I also have other things in there like movie thoughts on movies and other things. And usually there'll be some sort of tangential connection to the hobby as well. Um, but sometimes I just find that uh, I don't know whether it's sort of the same thing as writer's block or not, but sometimes I just find that I don't have the topics or the, um, the creativity a particular week to do it. And um, I don't get as excited about it. And so in some ways, um, for those that are doing creative stuff, like constantly, I don't know how they do it at times. Honestly, it's fairly, it can be easy at times if life presents you with things to talk about. And it can be kind of taxing at times if you're really thinking of things that you really want to talk about. So the topics that I have um, for today are things that have been rolling around in my head for a little bit. So they're not really very forced. And so I felt like today I could do a heresy hump day. So, um, First, well, I guess before I do my first topic and get into that, um, I do have a small table update. It's not huge, but just I'll just show you what I've been working on just the last couple of days. So for the table update, um, I don't have a whole lot. For those of you that saw my stuff that I'm working on from last week, I did pull out um, Dr. Doom and started with him. My intention initially was to work with non-metallic metal on Dr. Doom. I really spent a couple of hours on doing non-metallic metal on him. And it's kind of funny, like in some ways I was really liking how it was going. And at a distance, even with my eye, I really liked it. I liked the way I was getting some transitions and some contrast, like I haven't before with non-metallic metal. But then when I actually was taking some photographs up close, I noticed I could see some chalkiness and some um, just some problems with the transitions, like when I was looking up close, and I, I kind of determined I needed to actually start over. So it was more of like a um, an experiment in working some non-metallic metal, but then I ended up covering it and starting over with a um, Vallejo um, metal color. I started with, uh, what is it, um, dark aluminum and then I, I, I used some white aluminum and then I covered with a null and oil. And I really do like it. I mean, I love the metallics for Vallejo model color uh, or model uh, metal color. But, um, but, you know, it isn't a cartoon effect like I initially was going for. Then I did do some wet blending and um, on the cloth. And so, yeah, I'm actually fairly happy with it. Um, painting in some shadows where the shadows should be. You know, Dr. Doom, I'm not finished yet, but um, the actual, other than trying to do non-metallic metal, the actual paint scheme is fairly simple for Dr. Doom because once you go with metal, depending on what you're going to do with it, then you just got your one dimension of your, your color for the cape and his outfit, and then there's just the belt, and, you know, there's some, I guess... Um, the things that attach a cape to, they're not pauldrons, because I believe pauldrons are on the shoulder, but the things that attach a cape to armor um, or gold, 
and it's kind of hard to see because they're on the top of his arms where his hands are there but um, really it's not a difficult kind of color scheme to do for the most part and I am liking the way he's looking Doctor Doom is probably one of my favorite Marvel villains uh, unfortunately, unfortunately he's not really in the cinematic Marvel universe as we know it today he was in some really bad Fantastic Four movies for those of you that don't know this, um, apparently there is a Fantastic Four comic resurgence uh, at the end of the summer, and that means the possibility of a movie, if that's the case. My understanding is that Marvel is potentially Marvel Studios, Disney, getting some rights to Fantastic Four, and if they did a great job with Fantastic Four, I think it would be awesome, because they're just such a prototypical, you know, um, like, important part of the Marvel Universe. And then... The only other thing I could hope for beyond that is that another nemesis, uh, the Submariner, Prince Namor, be introduced to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There's been rumblings about that. I would love that. I love him as a character. Um, lots of funny YouTube videos comparing Aquaman to Submariner and people making fun of Submariner, but I am a huge Submariner fan. Um, I love the rage from the uh, Atlantean Prince. Some of my best memories were, as a kid, reading comics where the Submariner takes on the Hulk single-handedly. Um, yeah, but this is about Doctor Doom, I suppose. And so, um, yeah, Doctor Doom had some pretty cool rules for the Marvel Universe miniatures game when it came out. I never got to really use them before I quit the game because they stopped it. I never seemed to stop talking about that either. Um, but... That is kind of what I'm working on. And so once I finish this guy, I'm thinking it'll either be Woodland Indian or starting the Roman bust. And so, yeah, so back to the chat. All right, so um, back to the chat. And first topic is the movie Hostiles. So this movie, as I said, is by Scott Cooper. And so there we go. There's a Walmart sticker over Christian Bale's face there. Um, but this movie has Christian Bale and Wes Studi, among other people, that uh, are in the movie. Um, Christian Bale is an actor that I've always really liked. The majority of his movies, I really look forward to him in a lot of different roles. And so when I saw this one, um, I didn't buy it because it's Christian Bale per se, but I liked the trailer quite a bit. And... It also has Wes Studi, who many of you may know that um, he is sort of the main protagonist in um, not Musket and Tomahawks, but Last of the Mohicans. <laughs> Those two kind of go hand in hand for me. And I've always loved him in that role, and I've liked him in other roles as well. And he plays sort of a, ne a nemesis character, I suppose, in some ways. It's a fairly transformative um, character that as kind of um, multi-dimensional, I should, I should say, in the film. Um, when I first saw the trailer on television, just I didn't get to see this in the movie theater. I really kind of wanted to. It was competing with a lot of the Marvel films at the time, but I really liked what I saw. And one of the things that I really liked is, and I'm going to th throw, as I've probably been already throwing some photos up post-filming, um, it has some really beautiful imagery in the in, in the trailer as well as some of the scenic shots. It actually isn't completely forest or like alternative landscapes and scenery, but I would say that it reminded me a lot of some of the older films by um, Clint Eastwood that I enjoyed growing up where they had some alternative settings. Typically when I watch Westerns, um, I oftentimes notice the southwestern landscape, the fairly dry, arid landscapes, which are really prototypical of the genre. Um, and you also see the sort of really dusty, dry kind of towns that um, a lot of these sort of dust up fights happen in Western films. And that really predominates my thinking a lot of times when I think of Westerns, but I really like, because the West and, and sort of Westerns really encompass, encompasses so much, it encompasses the northern part of the country as well, there have been films for sure that have highlighted that. 
I just find that they're a little bit less frequent. And, um, you know, another one um, besides some of the ones from Clint Eastwood would be The Revenant, um, you know, with Leonardo DiCaprio that was shot actually in Alberta where I live. Um, and the imagery on that would have been like kind of alternative to that Southwestern, typical Western film. So I really liked the look of this and I really liked the look of what they were showing that the film was about. It seemed like it was a bit of a mission that um, was happening. And I got a sense from the trailer and I'm just thinking back, I haven't watched it recently, but I got a sense that there was a bit of a slow pace and darker element to the film, which I really love my cerebral dark films. Um, I'll throw this out there now. I've got some notes for this, but I just, one of the things just that I remember thinking about when watching the film is that the film that this really reminded me of, even though the, the plot and the subject matter is really not the same at all, but the film that it most reminded me of is a favorite of mine, and that is um, There Will Be Blood with Daniel Day-Lewis. It has a very dark, menacing component to the film, despite being a historical, you know, that's sort of the lens that it's crafted within. And um, I really drew parallels in some ways to my liking of this film to There Will Be Blood, um, just a longtime top movie favorite of mine. Um, so I have watched some reviews on this and, you know, from what I remember, it was just sort of mixed reviews, you know, folks watching. I mean, some folks were not really that into the genre to begin with. They were just sort of general reviewers, just reviewing it as a film. Um, and, you know, there, there was this theme that comes up. So I apologize. Um, I'm not going to really spoil heavily the film, but I'm going to talk about sort of the, the themes found within it. Um, you can kind of try to skip forward to our next topic of uh, Western tabletop games if you really are sensitive to that and, and want to see this and don't want any spoilers whatsoever. But the theme that um, because Christian Bale does play a cavalry officer, um, and, he, and he, a big part of the film, you know, what's happening is the transporting of a chief to his native homeland. Um, it just so happens there's animosity there because this particular, you know, Christian Bell's character is fought and slaughtered and killed and been slaughtered by Native Americans throughout his entire career. And so you get the impression that it's been both ways that, you know, like he's had men devastated and killed. The movie opens up with an attack by a group of Native Americans on a homestead that's really, really brutal. And you really do, they do actually show the vice versa violence on two cultures right from the beginning, you know, fairly early on in the film. I mean, they do a good job of showing the back and forth of violence that's happening equally um, on both of them. And you do get a sense of sort of the strain that that puts on individuals throughout the film. But early on, they highlight that within the characters and just characters that are living a life of violence, you know, PTSD and things like that. Um, and in the film, granted, it's a bit of a spoiler, but in the film, there's a forgiveness element that is demonstrated. And many people that have reviewed the film have latched on to that, that, you know, like this was a film about forgiveness. I really felt that that perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm trivial I'm, or I'm just looking too far into it, but I really felt that kind of as a surface level view of it in the film. Um, when Christian Bale is to get orders from his superior officer, and I believe it was a reporter or a politician, but I think it was a reporter or a paper or something back home, you know, like they forced him to take this mission. He didn't want to take it because he has bad blood with uh, with Studi's character. And they really do highlight that he doesn't really identify with folks back home. Like Christian Bale doesn't identify with mainstream society. Having done the kind of things he's done and being called to do and have the life that he's had, he no longer really identifies with the folks he's kind of thinking he's protecting. Um, 
And this is a common theme that comes up in war. You know, it's not, this is not unique to this period. But throughout the film, like he goes through this transformative process of identifying with his enemy. And I would say that one of the things that kind of comes up in the film as a theme is actually that he identifies more with his enemy than anyone else throughout the course of his kind of adventure or exploration that he has to go through. And I thought that was kind of a powerful thing. I, I thought it was really neat because really like forgiveness is kind of, you can see that pretty quickly happening. But what I think is hard to see a little bit in, in, in context is that really it's the only one he really identifies with. It's not that all of a sudden he identifies with his enemy and, and accept them, you know, in, in his world. Really, it's the only, the only, like the, the killer that he was always trying to kill and kill and, and you know, the back and forth, they, they killed each other's men and things like that. They're really, in some ways, the most the same in the end than anyone, either one of them were trying to protect or, or um, you know, represent. The interesting thing, um, so the film was very dark, it was very slow paced and had a very cerebral like element to it, which I really enjoyed. It has beautiful cinematic shots that you would of often see in Westerns because it's just beautiful landscapes. So the, the shots and the footage were wonderful. And to me, that's a big part of the entertainment right there. I love seeing that and being immersed in it. Um, the film in the end, um, there was a portion where he's sort of returning without spoiling like how it ends, he was returning back to society, Christian Bale's character. And, you know, the, the only, the thing that really left me with a question was, is how he was really ever going to assimilate. And granted, there were some things that happened where he developed some relationships that could carry on throughout, even into the end of the film. And perhaps having those around him, you know, that transform through the process with him gives him a chance. But in the end, um, I thought that sort of internal transformation of being a person that is incapable of really identify, identifying with anyone um, at all, and then most identifying and transforming to identify with the one that you're sort of sworn, have a sworn hatred the most of, was actually quite interesting. Um, and so Hostiles was a really good film in my mind. If you like historicals, dark, cerebral action, um, slow pace, beautiful cinematography, um, then you may end up liking this one. I will say that I had a really good hunch on this. And I normally never buy a DVD or Blu-ray that I've never seen before. Um, you know, unless it was like it's in the $5 bin or something like that. And I kind of have a feeling I'm going to like it. Maybe I have, but most, but brand new, like top dollar, like right off coming out of the theater, no way. This one, I had a hunch and I did. I actually, I really wanted to see it in the theater. I missed it. And I just said, you know what? I'm just gonna take a chance. And I really enjoyed it. And I highly recommend it for those of you that um, like Westerns and, and like the kind of films I describe. Okay. So um, rolling into this, I kind of thought I've been wanting to talk and revisit the discussion of Western tabletop games again, and in some ways in light of the discussion that we just had. I kind of indicated that I'm on this sort of quest, it's a, it's almost humorous to me, and that I'm, I'm kind of on this quest to find a Western game. I've had a lot of people suggest games to me, and I appreciate that, but I've always felt that um, they always kind of come up short in some way when I look into them. Now, this may relate to a subject that we're going to talk about in the third topic of the day, but, and that is like always finding something wrong and like never being satisfied um, as, as with, a, with a game or games because you see so many and then like one doesn't have one that another one has. And there's just so many ways to just kind of not want to do something if you're really particular. Um, but recently, I, what I thought 
some, I was reading into this and somebody made a comment on a forum once that the Western genre genre is fairly dominated in our minds and culture by cinema. And that even though the sort of conflicts and the history that's happened in the West within North America is very much part of history and exists and written about. And I'm sure that people have taken it seriously and it's its, its own area, area of history. Within entertainment, um, it's really, really reliant on the cinema genre in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of people, when they think of the West and the Wild West and stuff, they oftentimes think of the cinema. And when you look at tabletop games, many of them have direct, directly capitalized on that or incorporated that within the system. Well, they literally will even call like a round and act, like, you know, like act one, like, you know, you're staging like kind of a Western cinema sort of creation. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. In some ways, I think that could be a lot of fun if that's kind of what you're, you're into. Um, but then at the same time, I feel that sometimes it can bleed through and create Sometimes I think if the game is focused that way, it can limit what you can really do with the game and sort of the breadth of the game. It could really be just focused on that little dusty town, and that's really it. And for me, it's really not what I want kind of out of a Western game in a lot of ways. I think it'd be great to, to have those sort of little towns, um, you know, within a game and have that capability. But I also really, and, and even like your Southwestern landscapes, you know, um, you know, all the cactuses and just, you know, your typical thought of all of that. Uh, but I also like the idea of the other kind of components and like the Northern regions and like the forests and like all of the, the Northern tribes of Native Americans and things like that, like all of that. And then a lot of them do tackle cavalry as well. Like, you know, it wouldn't, there are many games that will have cavalry component the u.s cavalry but oftentimes it seems as if it's more about the outlaws and the sheriffs and like the smaller town stuff and you know you may have native americans and um you know mexicans and like various other ethnicities um in in the mix in most of the games but i feel like there are big elements that um, are oftentimes left out it seems with the variety In some ways, um, it's, I think I may have mentioned this already, but I think the games are oftentimes fast paced skirmish games that oftentimes um, lend to the Hollywood flair. And then for somebody that might be looking more for something that's more unit based and, um, or at least having the component of that, whether it be the cavalry or whether it be like uh, the native war conflicts and things like that, um, then, you know, it, it seems like that rule set, which is oftentimes the case in the way they're geared, are not going to really fill that niche. I've always kind of looked for something that has a bit more breadth to it, you know, that will encompass all of it. You could potentially have lone characters and gunmen or have them against a group, a posse that operates as a unit. Um, but oftentimes, like I said, it's, it's more just a handful of miniatures on each side and, and just using your, your men. And so, um, yeah, like, I think getting back to this idea of the genre being focused on the cinema, I drew a comparison in my head. And I know there are folks that watch the channel that play Congo. Um, I have a friend that is a professor of African studies, and he's also a tabletop gamer. And I, I think I might have mentioned uh, this on the channel once before. But when talking about Congo before it was released, I wasn't planning on getting into it, but because it's a studio Tama called Game, it's a new release, and the fact that he's, like, his career, he goes to Africa all the time, I mean, it's based on African studies, I kind of thought I'd bring it up to him just to get his thoughts on it. And it was funny, he's a really tolerant guy when it comes to games, he's not, like, the type that's going to get really mad about something not, like, reflecting reality, like, he's just going to look at it in the context of what the authors are trying to do of the game, and that's kind of what he did. He would said that he thought it looked like a fun game, but he acknowledged, in his opinion, that it still very much looks like a romanticized view of, 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 the, um, of the genre or the, the period within Africa. And, you know, he, you know, he said, you know, 
he didn't say that it was Tarzan, but he just said it's like that whole, what he, that's what he meant by it, like that whole romanticized thing, the viewpoint from like cinema and the Tarzan, incorporating that stuff in it to make it more attractive and entertaining. And so by all, by all means, it seems like a great game. I've actually followed a lot of battle reports from several folks, um, one of them being Ralph Astley, another one being Pete over at um, uh, Mini Wargamer. Um, and so, um, yeah, like, it's, um, I'm trying to think if there's anybody else I've seen games from Congo before, I'm not sure. But, um, yeah. Um, but I kind of drew a comparison between those two, and I was thinking, does, whether you agree or not, that Congo and some games that are in sort of like the heart of Africa can, can be subject to a highly romanticized or genre cinema genre component and make it difficult to have like take away from the historical component and that aspect um and you know like i love games that actually are like that i love saga and i'm not like i would never say that saga is like a strict historical dark age game because it's not you know the viking age you know it definitely has the myth the mythic part of it and it has a lot of fantasy elements and it's fun and i love it and i think i would like congo like in the same way but when thinking of the Western game, for whatever reason, I kind of yearn more for the historical side. And I'm wondering in that case, whether Western games have suffered from that. Now, some Western games these days are almost pure fantasy. I mean, there are a lot of them, like, um, I think it's Dracula's America or Dracula's West or something like that um, is, you know, Dracula, like within the Wild West. I mean, so you know, there are a lot of games that are incorporating undead and vampires and like lots of stuff into it. And I'm not even really going that far in, in, in comparing, using them as the comparison. I'm kind of using more just your game that seems to just lean towards regular Western cinema um, without those sort of fantastical elements. And I kind of wonder, is that one of the pieces as to why I'm struggling um, with adopting a a Western set of rules. And it's prevented me really from painting anything for it, even though I kind of want to do it at one point and I'm interested in it. I haven't really, it's one of those ones where I've found that the game itself and not having one that I've wanted to pick up so far has really prevented me from investing in it altogether. So I'm interested in, in all your thoughts for those of you that play Western games and or just in general have opinions on it on Western movies, things like that. Or even this concept of sort of the Hollywood component to the tabletop game within a historical setting versus the historical and how certain settings make it almost not even dominated, but almost just um, indistinguishable from, or you can't distinguish like really some of these settings from the Hollywood because that's really the way we're presented with it in most cases. Wow, it must be talking fast, or I don't have as much to say tonight, because I'm already burning through our two topics. I have my last topic, and this is going to be like a, a heresy wine, um, or it's just me kind of bringing up again various concepts of um, that I've brought up in the past, but just thinking about them a little differently. And I'm talking about the, the golden age of gaming. I've heard people refer to the golden age of gaming. Oftentimes people will use it to say today is the golden age, golden age of gaming. Like, you know, the amount of games that are available right now and coming out, Kickstarter, all of this stuff. It's the golden age of gaming. But even actually recently, a um, gentleman on one of my videos where I was showing the old TSR AD&D &D miniatures, one of them referred to like the early 80s as the golden age of gaming in their opinion. And, you know, just the variety of miniatures that were coming out at that time, in their opinion, they referred to it that way. So it's interesting to see how people define the golden age of gaming to them. This topic's a little misleading because I'm not really focusing on defining what the golden age of gaming is. It's more a question of, are we really in the golden age of gaming today because of all the variety that's out there? Um, variety is usually a good thing um, variety is the spice of life, you know, that's what they say. Um, I think 
when you see things like in cinema or video games, oftentimes seeing like more and more and more variety usually means there's more competition. There's like better stuff coming out. And it's a good thing, particularly if it's a really fast consumable. I think variety is really good when it's something that you can experience the variety at very little additional cost. And so, you know, being able to go to, many of you probably know of like the taste of whatever city you live in. So like, you know, you could have something like the taste of Calgary. I, I know for sure there was a, a festival when I lived in Buffalo called the New York, the, the taste of Buffalo. And, you know, you would go down and you can go to all the different stands and you can taste all the food and it's, they sell tickets and they give you little portions so you can just taste things and you can go around and taste a lot of different things. But really at the end of the day, you can kind of walk away with a meal or maybe a little more than a meal, but it's doable, right? And it's great because like you walk away and you feel like you've tasted of like a lot of different restaurants in the city that you live in and you know of places to go to now, you gain something out of it. And it's good, like the variety is good. But sometimes I think um, when things take, there are a number of reasons why I think sometimes variety can present challenges. I'm not going to say it's bad, but I could say it pre presents challenges in the enjoyment of a thing. Um, before I go into how easily something's consumed and how that affects things, I just today thought of Star Wars as a bit of an analogy. Um, recently saw Solo. Loved it, by the way. I know that I'm probably not alone, but a minority in that opinion. But particularly with the vast number of Star Wars movies that have come out, one thing that I've definitely noticed, regardless of what you think about on any particular Star Wars movie, most people within my age range seem to like the original movies. Uh, most people, if you hated those movies and you're almost not even in the discussion, like because if you disliked like, you know, the original releases, um, late 70s, early 80s of Star Wars, then most of the time, like, you're off watching Star Trek and you're not even in the discussion on, on the later movies. Like, you've already drew a line a long time ago. But if you like those original movies and if you have an opinion on Star Wars as a result of that, I find that we're at a point today where you can never really have in many people's minds a movie as good as the originals. And it's purely because so much has happened since then that people just pretty much find a reason to dislike something about anything related to the subject. If you're a Star Wars fan, there are very few people that just say, I love it all. Um, I've met some, I've seen some, but most of the time, everybody dislikes something, and it's just, they've been saturated with much more of the universe since they were a kid or younger, and were much more maybe accepting of it when it first came out, of the doctrine. But now, as the doctrine's changing and more is being added, it's just all of that variety that you see creates much more of a comparator towards the beginning and then to each other. So, like... You know, you can compare The Last Jedi to The Force Awakens. For those of you that may not know this, like, you know, Force Awakens came out, you know, in the last few years as a reboot of the Star Wars. And then, you know, Last Jedi was one of the more recent major releases of the main story arc. And, you know, there are people that like one, that don't like the other, that like both, but hated the ones, you know, episode one, two, and three that came out in the 2000s. And there's just a lot of opinion. But I find that all of the variety, to some degree, presents its own problem and makes it so it becomes way too complex to enjoy it for some people. And so where am I going with this with tabletop gaming and variety and the golden age of tabletop gaming? Well, one of the things I noticed is that um, more and more, because there's so many games and types of games out there, skirmish games, large-scale games, you go, I go games, random activation games, you know, games where they have pre-painted miniatures, games where you paint them yourself, games that use significant morale kind of systems, games that don't incorporate that at all. Um, just 
you know, games that have armor saves, games that don't, you know, games where you hit and you pretty much kill, and games that no, there's a toughness roll or a way to determine whether you kill after you've been hit. There's so many mechanics and differences with end games out there now that there, every game that comes out new, um, many people have a preference as onto any of those things I said and more, many more. Many of those people, many people have a preference for one or the other that they've developed over time. And most of the time, I, I think it's fairly certain that most of the time, no new game that comes out is going to side on your preference on every one of them. So there's always going to be a couple of things that are potentially, you'd love it for it to be slightly different. Um, and if you're playing with a group, you may not be the, be in the majority uh, on that. And most oftentimes groups want to play the game as written in most cases when it's a group of people because that's the common denominator so you don't have to argue about how it's ruling away the game. Um, and so I find that oftentimes these days many people, and to some degree myself, I'm not, I, I'm not immune to this, like my observation is in the criticism. Like I actually see this in myself as well. But I, I find that many people are almost searching for a holy grail that, that play a lot of tabletop games and that are always looking at tabletop games as they come out. There are a couple of problems with this. I mean, besides some of the obvious ones. The obvious one is that, you know, people are buying into a lot of games and getting out of a lot of games and wasting a lot of money and selling stuff to other people or developing huge collections that, you know, are about to pile onto them and kill them in their basement. And so I think that um, one of the problems with this is that there's this idea that um, of consumption, like I talked about before. And if they were video games, you could, you could just, aside from the price of getting into it, you could just pop it into your game console or your computer, play it for a bit, decide you don't like it, and there you go. I mean, you lost maybe the money investment but that's pretty much it. You can put it in and you can just even just sell it back used to the video game store and there you go. Trade it with a friend or something. And, and really, the overall investment was fairly low. With tabletop games, the investment is astronomical. Even with skirmish games at times, if you're the one that, unless you have a lot of crossover on your terrain and your tables, oftentimes to paint up miniatures, if it's a painted miniature game, um, or if it's even if it's not a painted miniature game, oftentimes the expense of painted miniatures and add-ons, you know, for with tabletop games can be quite high. Looking at Fantasy Flight games as an example, but then even if you consider the painting and then the table and even just reading the rules, I mean, you're you're typical. I mean, I know there's Age of Sigmar and a number of rules books that are very light on rules and reading and investment time, but most miniature games that have a certain amount of depth to them have a fair bit of reading that you need to do and investment to, to learn the rules. So when you look at all of that, it's not an easy consumable. And so I don't have any analogies off the top of my head of, of other things that people jump to and from that individually take a lot of time and effort and resources um, to, to try and evaluate. But I find that... Um, this hobby to me is really not, it doesn't lend, it's not really conducive to jumping from game to game frequently. Um, I think it can be very taxing. And I think a lot of people, even if they don't talk about it, they experience it if they do jump around a lot. I think it can, it can be frustrating. And speaking of like frustrating, I think that um, this idea of the golden age of tabletop games and variety, I guess what I would ask is just, satisfaction. You know, I find that I have a theory and my theory, and I've brought it up before, is that satisfaction really doesn't increase tremendously with variety in the tabletop gaming hobby. I find that most people that have been in the hobby for a while, if you talk to them and get a sense of the satisfaction of their gaming, most of them will harken back to days when they played less games and they were really quite into it. Now, it may, there may be other factors involved. There may be a time of their life where they had more time to just kind of hang out with friends and play a tabletop game, and that may be part of it. 
But I find even removing that, I, I see sometimes a dissatisfaction that comes with um, folks when they actually are looking for that holy grail game and then they do experience it and then they see all of the things that it doesn't have compared to other games they either play or that are coming out after they look into it. And what they realize is that even though there's a bunch of stuff they like, it's hard to actually let go of the things that they maybe don't find ideal about the game. So what is the answer to that? I mean, one answer is just to lighten up Francis, you know, like just just don't get so intense about it or like just try to change the way you think about it. And that's an easy thing to say and probably it's not going to work in the long run, but maybe part of the solution, I'm not sure for some. But the other thing is that um, think back to the Star Wars analogy and what was it that allowed people to enjoy the original that can't allow them to enjoy the movies that are coming out today. Well, it's really difficult to rewind the clock and to just unsee things you've seen and not compare. But I think in the end, for me, as long as you acknowledge something, I think just being kind of easygoing about something that you don't find as ideal and embracing the things you like about the game is really the way to go. Um, I can think of games where there might be something that I'm not, you know, that crazy about. But if I actually kind of just give it a pass on that particular component of the game and actually really focus on the things that I like, it makes it a lot easier. And it may be not that much different than just loving the shine on Darth Vader's, you know, suit and just seeing him walk into that, you know, that sort of ship and just the sound of him walking and the like the color of the lightsaber. I mean, it's forget about like that little plot thing that you just can't reconcile and just focus on the color of the lightsaber and how awesome that looks when you first saw it. That's the kind of thing I think that causes us to enjoy things when we get hung up on the little details that in some ways just won't allow us to enjoy something. And so are we in the golden gauge of tabletop gaming today? I guess if you like to look at a lot of different things coming out and if you look at opportunity for people within the industry and maybe more of an opportunity to play something that you've not had a chance to because there's so much more coming out then perhaps i i do think you know i don't know i still kind of think that we're kind of on i still think we're on the down slope compared to video games and other things that are out there um but you know maybe tabletop gaming um the golden age was at another time, you know, um, maybe the golden age was when, you know, maybe more, a bigger percentage of the population was playing, you know, a fewer set of games. I'm not really sure, but I do think that variety that's, that's come today has presented challenges in enjoying the hobby. And some people are going to say that this is not a challenge for them at all. They get it and they easily deal with it. But I've noticed this, and maybe you've noticed this as well among folks. Um, and so I thought it'd be kind of an interesting topic to bring up, and I'm, I'm interested in what other people think about it. Okay, everybody, um, short heresy hump day today. Looks like I'm clocking at just um, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes. Um, but um, yeah, hope you guys are having a good one, and take care.